Uh, welcome back to the third and final James W. Richard uh, lecture on the development of religious giving in the early, and early Christian church by Professor Peter Brown. My name is Mark Whittle. I'm in the astronomy department, and I'm current chair of the Page, Barber, and Richard committee, lecture committee. And before I hand over to Professor Paul Kershaw uh, to introduce Professor Brown, I'd just like to thank a few people who've helped make Professor Brown's visit such a success. Uh, let me begin, perhaps slightly unconventionally, by thanking Peter's wife, Betsy Brown, uh, for joining him in this uh, visit to Charlottesville and the University of Virginia. Um, I know you may not have uh, needed too much persuasion to leave a storm-battered Princeton, uh, but nevertheless, we're delighted that you joined Peter on this trip, uh, and we very much enjoyed your presence here and the chance to get to know you. And I hope you'll return to a Princeton with uninterrupted electrical power uh, and warm memories of your visit to Charlottesville. Um, others I'd like to thank include the former chair of the PBR committee, Walter Jost, uh, under whose watch Professor Brown was first invited to visit, and to Chuck Matthews, who was the committee member who nominated Professor Brown. Um, it's unfortunate that Chuck and his family are currently on sabbatical in Cambridge, England, and so he's missed this wonderfully enriching um, experience of Professor Brown's lectures and visit. I'd also like to, like to thank Religious Studies uh, graduate student Richard Jones, standing at the back there, uh, who is our tireless assistant for the PBR committee, and without whom anything with any details whatever would never actually happen. Also, uh, Professor John Miller for hosting the Browns on a tour of the university grounds, history graduate student John Terry uh, for helping with transport and uh, for, the, uh, for the Browns and hosting a visit to Monticello this morning, and to Paul and Adrian Kershaw for hosting a visit to the Kluge Aboriginal Art Museum. I'd also like to thank uh, Dick Holway, um, of, uh, who will be overseeing the publication of these lectures by the University of Virginia Press, Sean McCord and his team for running the audio system here, and Alex Jost for videotaping the lectures, uh, which uh, should be online via the Page Barber website in about a week or two. I don't want to say that too soon. Yeah, he's nodding back there. Okay, in a week or two. Uh, and lastly, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for coming. Uh, many of you have already expressed to me your deep and rich um, response to Peter Brown's truly remarkable lectures. Uh, and it's just this kind of organic response that really brings an event of this kind alive. So thank you for playing your own important role in making these lectures such a success. Let me now invite uh, Professor Paul Kershaw from the History Department to say a few words of introduction for this third and final lecture by Professor Brown. It is my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Brown this evening as he delivers his third and final James W. Richard lecture. It's no less of a pleasure to see so many of you here with us today in light of the level of sporting enthusiasm possessing Mr. Jefferson's University and paralyzing its roads on this Thursday afternoon. On the clash between sporting events and higher things, let me suggest, ladies and gentlemen, that we can take a text from Augustine writing about the public spectacles of late antique Carthage. Races, gladiatorial combats in the amphitheater, all competed for the attention of the pious Carthaginian citizen. Events were even scheduled on the same day. <laughs> what should be done? Letters, wrote Augustine, replace one spectacle with other more glorious spectacles. Demos pro spectaculis spectacula. Over the course of this week, we have indeed been given our own scholarly spectacular, our own wonders to watch. In his introduction yesterday, Bruce Holsinger of the Department of English spoke eloquently of the powers of Professor Brown's writing as writing. Coming as I do from the history department, I want to do what historians have a tendency to do. I want to look backwards to Professor Brown's earlier lectures, 
to the worlds he has shown us. He has taken us from the urban world of Paul, the great fundraiser, to the mid-fourth century and the Manichees of Kellis, deep within the Egypt's western desert, oil prospectors of a rather distinctive kind. With him, we've revisited the crowded cities of Syria with an eye line of the Stylite's pillars. What has struck me has been the newness of the vision he has given us. In his earlier work, he showed us how the shrines of saints and their relics, buzzing with virtus, were points, rather replosive microphone, points at which the visible and the invisible worlds met on earth. Here he has explored how in these centuries, heaven and earth could be joined through money, treasure in heaven. Attuned to locality, to dialects of life, and of course, of language, and how, he has shown us how poverty, piety, and work came together in distinctive constellations. No less, dialogic links between the poor, always with us, and what might be called, to rework Professor Brown's own words, the very special poor, the electi, the clergy. He has reminded us in person, as his words have done for so many of us, of us on the page, of the driving need to see the Christianities of these centuries alongside Judaism, alongside Manichaeanism, alongside Mithraism, in shifting landscapes of changing belief. Repeatedly, we have seen the subtle systems linking the changing inner lives of the men and women of these communities with the outer world, with social structures and social and economic change. The quarantined categories of history themselves collapse one into the other in Professor Brown's scholarship. Driving this work has been not only his own continued re-engagement with late antiquity and its sources, but also his constant and generous study of the works of other scholars. We leave these lectures as students, I suspect, must have left his Oxford tutorials with books to be found in libraries, references to track down, reading to be done, thinking to be done, rethinking to be done. But before we do that, before we head off to the library, let me now cede the lectern to Professor Peter Brown and allow him to put into place the final panel of his triptych. Let me invite him to speak on the work of the hands, the glory of Egypt, monks and work in fourth century Egypt. Peter Brown.